Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. First second Adam, first second King, first second Christ. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. Okay. <clears throat> We're in chapter 2 this morning. Let's pray before we get rolling. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Instruct us this morning not only so we understand what's here, but what, how it can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As chapter 2 opens, we are introduced to a man by the name of Boaz. And uh, he's a wealthy man and belongs to the same family tree, if you please, as Elimelech, who's Naomi's dead husband. And it would seem now that Ruth is the family supporter. She, like we mentioned last week and week before, she's gone back. She's gone from Moab, where she grew up, country of Moab, to uh, to Bethlehem, Jerusalem, to be with her. Well, let's see. No, it's Bethlehem, to be with her mother-in-law. And she's also a widow, having lost her husband when she lived in her home country there of Moab. And so seeking for some livelihood, Ruth does so by gleaning after the reapers in the harvest field. And, and an old custom uh, legalized in the law uh, of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy uh, permitted the needy stranger, or the orphan, or like we mentioned last week, the widow to gather what was left by the harvesters, simply called gleaning. And so Ruth heads out, and in its legal form, the injunction, well, let me read it, Deuteronomy chapter 24. You want to turn there? I read this last week, but I think it's important that we perhaps look at it again. Beginning with verse 19. 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. When you reap your harvest in your field <clears throat> and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs. Again, it shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. So that was a basic law, if you please, of, of uh, gleaning. And it implied that the field should not be picked clean, should not be uh, harvested clean, but that some should be left. And so at that time, at, or at times, there was little left to glean, and gleaning might be an un, unfruitful task, especially if done in the heat of the day. And this gleaning by Ruth was taking place during the barley har harvest, which I mentioned last week was late April through early May, and then the wheat harvest followed that. And also, the gleaning certainly was not made easier for a young uh, foreign woman, and like Ruth, in this case she was a Moabite woman, who might be molested by the male laborers. And so Ruth goes out, and the scripture says, in verse 3 of chapter 2, and we mentioned this last week, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. 
We'll talk more about that later. And impressed by the appearance of this young stranger, Boaz learned that she was the Moabitess who had returned with Naomi and who had been industriously gleaning after the reapers since early in the morning. And then so Boaz gave her special privileges, provided for her safety, since the laborers, like I mentioned, might be crude in their conduct. And he was, the, the landowner was not obligated to do that. He had people, he had servants who would oversee this gleaning. And so rarely would even the landowner show up. He just would, he was there. There was a hut that they had constructed uh, in the form, it was more than a hut, it was kind of a little house where they could, the, the gleaners could go in and relax and the workers out there could go and relax and, and just uh, take a break or whatever. And so he gave her a special privilege. He put her with his maidens who gathered the sheaves and, and he warned the young men against molesting her. He also provided for her physical needs, uh, fed her. And Ruth humbly acknowledged his favor and, and emphasizing by a play on words the fact that she was a foreigner. And then Boaz apparently knew uh, the story of Ruth's devotion to her mother-in-law, a devotion that had led her to forsake her own uh, kinfolk, if you please, back in uh, Moab. And his invocation on her of the divine blessing upon her a knowledge that she had, had now put her trust in the God of Israel and so uh, and was sheltering under God's wing or God's skirt, if you please. And we'll talk more about that uh, probably next week. And Ruth expressed grat grateful surprise that she, a foreigner, would be treated so kindly by Boaz. And so verse 13 of chapter 2 is where we left off last week. So let me read that verse. Chapter 2, verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Um, let me find favor should actually be, I've, I have found favor. I have found favor in your sight. And then she lists the reason. Because uh, I've noticed that you comforted me, you've spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. In other words, I'm not an Israelite. I'm, I'm a foreigner. And so she is there. And then at this point, she finds more favor in the sight of Boaz. He then welcomes this, if you please, impoverished Moabite woman, widow woman, by personally giving her some of his food. And he doesn't have to do that. A lot of times the laborers would bring their own food with them. But he shares with her his food, demonstrating to any onlooker that Ruth should be treated with respect and kindness. Look at verse 14. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, so this is probably lunch, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her or roasted grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Now, Boaz takes, well it says here, verse 14, and she kept some back or she had some left over. And it's interesting to note that Boaz probably purposed, purposely takes special care of her and gives her more of the roasted barley than she can eat. And what is left over, as we'll see a little bit later, will be taken back to Naomi as her evening meal or part of it. Then, 
Boaz directs more favor towards Ruth. When Ruth gets done eating and gets up to commence her gleaning, Boaz commands the male servants, the male harvesters, to let Ruth glean wherever she wants without interference and to even help her by leaving stalks for her to pick up. Stalks, S-T-A-L-K-S. Notice verses 15 and 16 of chapter 2 here. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. In other words, don't bother her. Leave her alone. Also, let grain from the bundles, or the stalks, remember they, they would... They would gather the grain up and they'd put it in stalks and then they'd, they'd stack those along and then, then people would come and gather those up and haul them away to the threshing floor. And so he says, also let grain from the bundles fall purposely. In other words, just what it says, do it on purpose. Even though that's not what you usually do, do it on purpose. Leave it that she may glean and don't rebuke her. So he's shown a great deal of favor. And so, uh, verses 15 and 6, 16. When she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. Don't reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and don't rebuke her. So any questions or comments so far? All right, <clears throat> so Ruth gleans the rest of the day, right up until evening, the scripture says, and she gets quite a haul. About 20 or 30 pounds of barley. It says, so she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley which was probably somewhere between, you know, different things that I've read could be anywhere from, from 15 to 30 pounds. And she heads home. Now I'd like you to, to take note of this. Ruth was no weakling. And it probably was not that far at home but even if you took 20 or 30 pounds and just even trudged up to shop smart with it, that'd be a little bit of a load. A little bit of a load. So verses, look at verses 17 and part of 18. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Then she took it up, and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw, key thing, her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. Can you imagine uh, Naomi's surprise and shock when she sees all of this grain, this, this barley that, that Ruth brings back to the house? Pardon? And pleasure. And pleasure see? in the light of the fact that she's a foreigner. And they, even though they were allowed to glean, they were not, the foreigners were not looked on kindly by, by the rest of the gleaners. Carol. And I would kind of think, um, depending upon how many gleaners there were at any given place and time or day, um, the pickings could have been fairly slim mm -hmm. to where it would be a subsistence, but not necessarily plenty. And I mean, I'd, barley happens to be one of my favorite grains, and I know from experience, it's a really yeah. filling grain. Yeah. Yeah. And so 20 pounds for two women by the time it's done well, with is a, a fair amount of yeah. what's gonna keep them fed yeah. for a while. Yeah. And plus she had, she brought home with her some that was already cooked. 
and <coughs> it could have been there may have been quite a crowd of gleaners out there and I think uh, in the light of the fact that Ruth being a foreigner a Moabite woman and adding to that being a widow plus she was young and I think Boaz purposely like it said here don't bother her and and even drop some stuff purposely and don't pick it up let her if she's gleaning behind you just make sure she's there and then drop some stuff so she sees it and picks it up and uses it Carol and since he knew the story he knew that she was a well, an in-law at yeah. least right yeah so it's kind of I don't know part of his family didn't he say he'd heard the story about Naomi and he yeah. would know Naomi so he probably was. realized that she she was uh, was an in-law but see even then she wasn't an Israelite she wasn't an Israelite and she was a, a foreigner Okay, any more questions or comments? He would have been aware of the laws in Deuteronomy, though, if he was a godly man. Yeah, he would. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know that he would have been aware to the point where he thought, okay, I'm the kinsman redeemer. Because you see, as we'll discover, there were some, there was a, a man who was closer, a closer relative than Boaz was. See, I think that Ruth was a beautiful woman. He was aware of her situation, how she came from her, her, her home country. And by her choice, chose to be chose to uproot and come to <coughs> Bethlehem, Judah with her mother-in-law. And he was aware of that. And so he, he, he would look kindly on her. A lot of your landowners that day, of that day, weren't this compassion, weren't this attentive to the gleaners. And like I said just a few minutes ago, they they would rarely just go out in the in the field. Rarely. And uh, I think I mentioned to you last week there was a, a fellow that I met in Shelter Cove, relative of of a uh, fellow who had passed away. And I was doing the memorial service so I spent quite a bit of time during the days leading up to the memorial service I spent quite a bit of time with the family and got to know him and uh, he was retired but he had all of this fruit and stuff that he brought with him I said where do you get this stuff and he was down lived down in the valley he says I'm a superintendent of the gleaners And if you go down through the valley, and I've done, gone down through there a couple times and uh, after the harvest, you, you can tell that the fields have been harvested, but there are gleaners out in the field. And this fella, he was a superintendent of those. He would get the gleaners and he would supervise them. He'd come in and he'd be there and he'd tell them where they could glean. And he says, some of them just hurriedly go through there and they get stuff. And he says, then I go through, because I can. And then he says, I act as a gleaner. And I get stuff and bring it home. And he says, I give it away. And in this case, he brought some, some stuff up with him. And so um, it's quite a, still done. It's still done in, right here in California, down in the valley, and a lot of other areas, and certainly still done in the Middle East. And, and countries around the world where they have things set up that way. Good comment, good questions. So on arriving back home, Ruth displays her gleanings <coughs>
like I mentioned, to an astonished Ruth or Naomi, and also gives her the food saved back from her noon meal with Boaz. Verse 18, last part of it there. Uh, then she took it up, went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she b brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. Now, I think it's important to mention here that there can be no doubt that can be no doubt of the genuine love and affection that Ruth has for her mother-in-law, right? Even though Naomi has been in a depressed mental state for quite a while. But Ruth stuck by her. A lot of times we stick by people when they're really riding high. But let them get down and we don't say, nah, I'd rather, I don't want to go around that person. That person will just drag me down. And, uh, but Ruth, I think Ruth showed her, displayed her love for her mother-in-law and her affection for her mother-in-law by just sticking by her. Uh, even though she had, like I mentioned, had been in a depressed mental state for quite a while. Because remember what she says? Entreat me not to leave you. That's when they were back in Moab. Or to turn back from following after you. Wherever you will go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts you and me. So she vowed before she even left Moab with Naomi. That that, that was going to be the situation. I'm going to stick by you no matter what. And uh, we need more of that. We need more of that in churches. I'm going to stick with this church no matter what. But a lot of times, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, people are leaving churches by the droves simply because stuff doesn't go right in their eyes in their eyes. <clears throat> We've had people leave this church simply because there's nobody playing a bunch of instruments up on the stage. And I ask them, so do you come to church to get entertained? Mm. Well, no, but one of the comments I hear sometimes is, "The church doesn't meet my needs." Oh, I know. And I always want to ask them, "What do you do to meet the church's needs?" What would when you? When someone what? says, "What do you?" I always want to ask them, "What do you do to meet the church's needs?" Yeah. Because when you know, Butch had a cousin all the time that was always ranting and raving against yeah. God and. God doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. I'm, you know, carrying on. One day I got bold and I said, what do you do for God? Yeah. yeah. When uh, we, <laughs> we, what did you say to everything? I said he just cussed at me. <laughs> <laughs> <was bothering. laughs> right here at this church, especially since I've been here, we placed a strong emphasis on the teaching of spiritual gifts. And we've taught it with balance. We've taught it with balance. And, and our pastor and myself included have, we've reminded people that everyone has a spiritual gift. And you are to use your spiritual gift. And a lot of times, we rely on other people using their spiritual gifts to make us happy. Well, sure, the pastor's using his gift of teaching and preaching 
but don't ask me to and and I really enjoy it but he keeps asking me well you have the gift of this so I'd encourage you to use it I don't want to use it I don't have time to say I don't have time to use it gosh I'm only there on Sunday morning what do you expect heard the story probably not true and maybe true about the fellow who <coughs> I think I've told you this the only time he ever came to church was on Easter Sunday and he had a tendency to moan and groan and complain so as the pastor's at the door as he's leaving that morning he says well pastor I was here today but I have one complaint. Pastor said, what's that? He says, every time I come, you preach on the resurrection. <laughs> Complainers, oh, they grumble on a Monday. Tuesday, grumble the whole week through. People do, and then they, they, they store up all of these grumblings sometimes, and they come and they vent them. Church. Hmm. So sad, so sad. We got, we got guys at the mission. Okay, I'm in here. What can the mission do for me? And they are absolutely shocked when they come in to the mission and all of a sudden they have a job. And one, that's one of the things we tell them. So... Uh, You'll have, you can free wheel it for a couple of days, but then check the schedule. Schedule. Yeah, to see what your duty are. Duty. I have a duty. <coughs> oh, yeah. I got to put out Bibles on the tables every chapel service all week. Oh, yeah. I got to wipe the tables. Yeah. Had one fellow leave this week, and he just didn't want to do his job. First of all, he said, I don't wash dishes. Because we, uh, we created a new position. It's called kitchen helper. And basically, that's it. Not needed all the time in the kitchen, but they need to stand by in there and see what needs to be done and Nash the cook will say, "Okay, wipe this table down, or you know, wipe, wipe this uh, cooking station clean, or whatever, and uh, just take these pots and pans and go ahead and stick them over there because it gets busy." And uh, and Nash is only one person, and he takes pride in what he does as a cook, and he wants to get that stuff ready. And uh, and the Jason Jesse, the house manager who created this position, with the approval of Brian Hall, the director, Jason says, and Nash may, may want you to, to make salads from time to time. He says, oh, I told myself a long time ago that I would never make salads. Jason says, well, that's what it is. So he said, I'm just going to put you in the kitchen as a kitchen helper. He says, you do? then I'm going to be sick tomorrow. Stay in my bed. I'm going to be sick. Don't have to do anything. So then Jason, who's got a pretty long fuse, but all of a sudden Jason's fuse gets very short. And he says, you know what? Those are the choices. And that's where I'm going to put you on the schedule. And you need to either choose to be there or not. He came in about a half an hour later and says, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And it's kind of sad. But in situations like that, sometimes our thinking is, well, don't let the door hit you too hard when you walk. It's, it's, it's kind of sad to feel that way. But sometimes you do what you can. Got a report later in the day that, of course, we've seen him get a cab and said he was going to a motel. We got a report later in the day that he was drunk. Mm 
So the reason he wanted to go out wasn't that he wouldn't, didn't want to wash dishes, he wanted to go drink. Sometimes they don't say that. But do we have an idea that that may happen? Yes, we do. See? And so we got to be grateful. We got to be grateful for what we have. And not what can we get out of church, but what can we do to help build the body? Pastor has said time and time again that his his ministry, my ministry as well, is to equip the saints to what? Do the work of ministry. I don't think you'll ever hear in this church, you won't hear it from the pastor and you won't hear it from me, a message. So let me share with you this morning on how to warm a chair. Five steps. I think you understand what I'm saying. Now, <clears throat> beginning at the next verse, verse 19, in this second chapter, and then for the rest of chapter 2, we see, and this is such a beautiful sight, we see Naomi's sadness lifting. First of all, she pronounces a blessing on the one who came to her daughter-in-law's aid and at this point, not knowing who it is. Okay? You got that? Notice first part of verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed, or blessed be the one who took notice of you. Hmm. Then, Ruth reveals who the landowner is. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Mm. And then verse 20, very important verse, provides for us the link to what takes place in the rest of the book of Ruth. Notice verse 20. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, mm, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. So he's not only related to us, he's a close relative. Mm. And by saying that Boaz is not only a relative, but a close relative, Naomi means by that that God, catch this now, God, I'm going to, my notes are going to slide off on the floor, specifically and providentially, sovereignly, if you please, directs Ruth, or directed Ruth to the field of Boaz, so that, and I want you to get this, so that Boaz might get to know Ruth better and ultimately marry her as her kinsman redeemer. And this marriage would be a levirate marriage. Remember when I mentioned that a few, a few weeks ago? And that is in which the nearest relative would marry and care for a widow. More about that next week. And God's provision of this marriage would thus be a show of ultimate kindness to the living and to the dead. To the living, Ruth and Naomi, by ensuring the two of them would be cared for by Boaz for the rest of their lives. And showing kindness to the dead, Naomi's husband Elimelech, and Ruth's husband, Malon, by ensuring that the name, reputation, and inheritance of those two dead guys would endure in, this, in the couples, that is Boaz and Ruth, their firstborn son. We'll talk more about that next week. So now, in the light of Naomi's newfound optimism, 
And I'd like you to just see uh, the before and, and after. Before this revelation that Boaz is the one who reached out in kindness to Ruth. Before that revelation, here we have a, a lady with a sad countenance. Without hope. And all of a sudden, she's hit with the name Boaz. And it jumps out in her heart, in her mind, like a neon sign. Wow. Wow. So in the light of Naomi's newfound optimism and in response to additional info about Boaz provided by Ruth, Naomi gives strong instructions to her daughter-in-law. Notice verse 22. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It's good, my daughter, that you go out with, this, with these young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. In other words, don't you go to any other field. You just, you go to Boaz's field. Good advice from a mother-in-law. So, Ruth not only gleans in the field belonging to Boaz for the rest of the barley harvest, but she continues to glean on into the full wheat harvest season. Notice verse 23. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz, to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. And what's more, all the while she's doing that, she lives at Noemi's house. Hmm. We're going to stop there. Next week we're going to get into uh, just a couple verses in chapter 3. And I want to focus in on next, next week on this Leverate marriage stuff. And also this thing of a kinsman redeemer. Personally, I hadn't looked at that stuff in detail for a long time. And I dug into it a little bit, uh, quite a bit more this week in preparation. And so I want us to, to just understand how this Leverate marriage worked. Not much is said about it, but yet it had some strong implications within the, the Israelite community. L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E. -E, leverate. And, uh, and then this thing of kinsman redeemer. And I want to share with you uh, how especially the kinsman redeemer parts plays into who? Jesus. Jesus. And how Ruth, Boaz, uh, Ruth, Boaz, oh, and even Naomi, how they play into this whole true life drama as, we, as it looks forward to the coming of Christ. Because you see, as I mentioned last week, a couple women, two or three four or five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. And Ruth is one of them. Ruth is one of them. A Moabite woman who marries the son of a prostitute. I was given, I was telling some of the folks that were here last night that <coughs> the uh, guys at the mission in some of their terminology, they get right to the guts and nitty gritty of stuff. And I was just doing a quick overview of some of the Old Testament stuff this last Friday in my class that I teach every Friday. And we talked a little bit about the Book of Ruth and got four or five of the guys right now who are going through the Book of Ruth that completely apart from anything that I've said, they just were reading through the Bible and they just got stuck on the book of Ruth and because it was short they read it on several occasions they come in they have questions and uh, I said so uh, what can you tell me about Ruth well she was a foreign lady okay um, who'd she marry Boaz and I said okay 
And what was, who was Boaz's mama? Two or three of the guys said, Rahab. And then I said, and what did Rahab do? And you know, I shared with a pastor and someone that you were here last night, that in the church, in a church setting, we probably say, well, she was a harlot. Or she was a prostitute. But these guys right away said, she was a hooker. And one guy says, she was a rich one. Which she was. And uh, they get right to it. But it's amazing how Ruth, Moabite woman, a foreigner, marries a fella whose mama was a hooker and is in that genealogy of Jesus. Amazing. Amazing. We'll talk more about that next week. Any questions or comments as we wrap it up? What do you got, Pastor? In the Paul's third missionary journey, probably one of the most poignant speeches uh, in all the Bible that Paul talks to the missionaries. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Don't leave. Thank you, Lord, for your love. <laughs> Thank you for this true, these true events in the life of Ruth and her mother-in-law. And so help us to continue to learn, especially as we look forward to next week as we talk about Boaz as a kinsman redeemer and the tie that he has uh, in a very practical way through the ministry of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.